and uh, this is the time that we have an open conversation. So it really depends on you whether we're here for five minutes or for another hour. Um, well, let me start with you, Dan, first. And since we've, and I had the pleasure of working with you uh, some years ago, and the whole issue of climate and conflict, um, without going into direct causal relationships or attribution, but one of the things that we came up with in our work was coining the phrase, the consequence of the consequences. And um, what we can kick off with if we just want to elaborate a little bit on that. It's a catchy phrase, but it actually encapsulates a lot of the work that we've done a few years ago. To go to the, the theme that I raised earlier, uncertainties, there's a whole lot of uncertainties about what the effects of global warming are. And the more you try to trace those in detail, and the longer you make the chain of effects, the harder it is to be certain about that absolute attribution. But you can draw, draw up models, essentially, which are narratives of what you could expect to happen based on comparable experience elsewhere. And then you can see. You can see if the real world starts to bear any resemblance to this. So, for example, if people's, um, if the human habitat in some places becomes less habitable because the rainfall pattern changes dramatically, for example, either because precipitation increases or because it concentrates so that the monsoon gets shorter and more dramatic and what used to be 42 days of rain falls in 20 or so days, like in Nepal, or because major weather events like typhoons shift their locations, as they have in the Philippines, or because you get extended droughts, then that has an impact on how people are living. Or perhaps they're able to ride it out. Right? But perhaps the impact is so serious and the assistance that is available to them from government or from international organizations is not good enough or quick enough or inclusive enough or, to use a completely non-scientific term, is not kind enough, perhaps it's not reliable enough, then maybe people start to move. And if they move, where do they go? Well, mostly, although there have been a lot of fears raised about climate migration, right? Mo uh, in, U in Europe, for example, mostly people move within their country. And they move from the countryside to the city. At most, they may move across the border. And in that case, to where are they migrating? Are they migrating to areas which can accept, can host, can manage to have those additional people there? If not, they will put pressure on the resources which are there, which are available. They will put pressure on all, all kinds of things, from the availability of drinking water, to firewood, to um, living quarters, and so on. And as that pressure is put on, people will have problems, they will seek explanations, they will identify the outsiders as part of the problem. If the, again, if the government is not inclusive enough, supportive enough, conceivably, the problems will emerge from that. Um, there are all sorts of other scenarios that one could draw up. I think the one which, in terms of tracing consequences of consequences, one of the ones which I find most interesting is if you have droughts and perhaps other climate variability in major food producing countries, what does that do to the world price of staple foods? Like, for example, wheat. Right? And what does that do to the price of bread in, for example, a Middle Eastern country, which is a, the world's largest importer of wheat, where people in the good times are spending about 35 to 40 percent of their disposable income on staple foods, and where prices are only kept at a manageable level by government subsidy. What happens if the world price rises dramatically at the end of 2010 as a result of drought in China and um, diverse weather conditions in Australia, the US, and Canada? 
Um, what happens then if the Egyptian government is not able to continue to subsidize the food price effectively? Would you think that people would get angry at that point? You know, I, I go back to my sort of basic learning about these things. Um, a hungry man is an angry man. A song was made out of that. And there is a basic wisdom there. So, in part, lying behind the story of Tahir Square, it is not the full explanation of what happened in Egypt in 2011, not by any means, but in part, there was a change in natural conditions, but not in Egypt. Mm. It was across mm. the other side of the world. Mm. That's what we mean by the consequences of consequences, and probably what we mean by interconnected and interdependent. Mm. And that was, in research, that was defined what happened in 2010 as merely a tipping point. Yeah rather than the actual cause of what happened. So if I, if I go from this to Emily and to the, what you call the, threat, the human security framework, mm. do you want to elaborate on that a little bit and just kind of pick up from where Dan has left and how, how would that come into effect and how would that be of, of value mm. to uh, processes like these? Yeah, so <clears throat> that framework so, sort of explains how security has been coined and thought about conventionally, traditionally, within sort of international relations and within uh, sort of um, studies around conflict where security is seeking stability, but it's also the nation state seeking its own interests and own territory. So there's something in there which is different to this uh, framework which um, is more about, as Dan was talking about, the solidarity and engaging with citizens and starting from, so changing the way we think about security, or it might also be changing the way we think about risk and frame risk more from the, the aspects or the sectors or the dimensions in society that have a meaning for people. So, for example, if we think about um, thinking about ecological security in, in, in a more solidarity, we might be thinking about how we safeguard nature for the benefit of people and particularly those most at risk or the, the most vulnerable communities. So it's re reframing that. Maybe we could think about creating security with our political systems yeah. in a way that anchors people yeah. better yeah. Um, to be able to be more resilient in a, uh, in a good way. <laughs> we can talk about that. Uh, building capacity and so on and so forth. So it's more thinking about the lo building the strength in the local yeah. context, yeah. Yeah. Um, which maybe um, one can, through a different kind of fr framework, but putting it into practice is where the challenge comes, which is very much what uh, Margaret has been talking about and also yourself about actually putting, implementing these things among citizens and changing the way people think, uh, starting from that point. Which is, which is a lot more holistic than some of the earlier calls that we can somehow battled against of securitizing climate yes. impact, which is actually yes. was quite dangerous of isolating just climate and dealing with it as a security issue. Yes. That leads to a very different type of thinking in that. So bouncing sort of yeah. back with extreme events and with a more holistic approach like this one, um, and including issues of governance, for example, where would that fit, Margaret? You, we're, we're, we're having a whole host of issues in terms of human security generally, from food security to political stability, issues of governance. Um, and there is sometimes, there is also, I, I come from your world, there is sometimes a tendency to also isolate extreme events and still deal with them as a one-off. And they are never a one-off. Of course. Can I start? I promised someone in the audience that I would be provocative at least once today. <laughs> yes. I, I thought you've already been several times. <laughs> <laughs> so just on attribution. Mm. Yes. I mean, this is not a scientific concept yet. It's a political one. So what do we want to spend our energy on in the next 20 years? to really reap the benefits of the breakthrough in Paris, which was, you know, whatever, it was a breakthrough in terms of pulling down the political barriers on a lot of the climate change debate. We have this 
Clim Green Climate Fund, which actually has an enormous amount of money, but they haven't spent a dollar yet. <laughs> so, my, my, when I hear you talk about the important, and I agree, long term we will be able to attribute, but are we going, is our choice to get bogged down in the politics of negotiation about attribution? Because for those of you who are not party to this, attribution means compensation, and compensation is where we've been stuck for the past 20 years of endless negotiation. So the, I, I just want us to think concretely about... <laughs> I'm provoking um, Ellen, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have to do that also, but in the next decade, I think, because my second point on this getting stuck with the event, and um, over the, the year, the five years leading to 2015, like everybody else, I went to billions of conferences on climate change and extreme events. And uh, I realized very quickly that the only concrete way that the climate community had to show climate change was a disaster. So essentially I said, I can sit back and wait for them to finish because they are doing the job for us on the risk management, except that they didn't want to take the risk word. Mm -hmm. So, so this is a bit where we are right now. We've reached a convergence point, and in a way the disasters have helped the climate community to illustrate some of the most dramatic consequences, but certainly not all of climate change. We have pushed the risk word forward, and to and I, I was also thinking of a wise man who once said that a, ve a required quality in a good scientist is imagination. So how do we move to actually start imagining what those risks could be and try to really bring them down to concrete things? Because I think, you know, there are so many political, social, emotional solidarity factors that will continue to drive our need to help people in the event. So the ones that take the responsibility for the longer term thinking, the socio-economic development, etc., have to be almost forced through policy measures and political measures. <laughs> and we are not, we will never stop helping people. That's yeah, our good sure. side, and we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But we should be a bit wiser on how we distribute the resources. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I, I'm not going to take the words in my mouth that politicians do these days. Is disasters are becoming too expensive, so we have to invest more in development. That is not the logic. <laughs> Yeah. Because that doesn't solve the political challenges yeah. that yeah. come along the way. So, no. yeah. so there you are. Yeah. Attribution. Well, well, <laughs> the, what, what I'm optimistic about, and we, we've been in this field for quite some time, is at least these two communities are talking to each other. That's yeah. a good start. The yes. climate community yes. and the disaster community. Yes. <laughs> now, we turn to infrastructure systems and societal systems. What you've, we've listened to Emily's uh, presentation. How do you see this holistic human security framework reflected or of value to the way we perceive we deal with risk to critical infrastructure, for example? Yeah. Now, it's not isolated by itself, but it's part and parcel yeah. of the whole. And I don't mean just in Sweden here, but... No, but I mean, you realize when you listen to all these speakers that uh, things are connected and... <laughs> Of course, they are connected to a higher extent than only among in critical infrastructures. I mean, you, you yourself, you mentioned the consequences of consequences and food prices rising in a place that is not sort of physically connected directly. Um, that tells me that these dependencies and interdependencies are crucial to understand many of these issues that we are dealing with here. And if there is one lesson that, that I've learned from sort of looking at critical infrastructure is that we have a tendency to narrow our focus and, and look and try to divide the problem into segments and try to solve one at a time. And then we imagine ourselves that we can just put the pieces back together again. 
I don't think that works always, not with these complex uh, problems. You have to look at it from a holistic perspective. And I guess that is also valid when you broaden the perspective to a more sort of ecological system as yeah. well. Yeah, which, which goes back to sort yeah. of the, one of the definitions of resilience is that if you get to a system that demonstrates characteristics that are not present yeah. in the parts or the components of the system or one that is capable of learning self-organizing and adapting to the unknown, then you get to a completely different outcome. Absolutely, and in this discourse, we're quite bad at operationalizing resilience in that way. Mm -hmm. We are good at <clears throat> studying resilience despite systems mm -hmm. rather than thanks to systems, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to get better at understanding what are actual resilient systems rather than some resilient actors in a perhaps very brittle and unforgiving system. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a totally different approach from investing in actors and looking at the system as a whole. Is MSB doing this? Looking mm -hmm. at the systems as a whole yes. or having a holistic perspective? Yeah. Yeah. I think we are, but I also think, I also want to be once again a bit modest here and admit that it is super difficult. I've heard Dan saying that conflict, that it's not necessarily a bad thing, that it's, it's about development, it's about evolution. And I think it's a little bit the same thing in our line of business, crisis management, that a crisis is in a way an opportunity because it actually helps open your mind. Okay, so this was also possible. This seemingly unexpected is possible. So, because I feel that one of the things we are constantly struggling with is to get uh, the, the attention of the political leadership about things that haven't as yet happened because they seem so unrealistic. So, uh, you know, we, we have these scenarios, um, but we can never really model. We can never really model the interconnectedness. We can never really capture these worst case scenarios. Um, we are though, right now I should say, and this is very much a result of also what we're doing in, in civil defense planning, and we have this new buzzword uh, called hybrid threats. Uh, which is what is happening, you could say, also in the grey zone uh, before we move in, into a war. And uh, here we are talking about, I would say, a number of things, really bad things, possibly happening at the same time. Uh, so you could have for example, a disinformation campaign. You could have a sabotage against critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This could coincide with an extreme weather event. So you could have this happening at the same time and that you, then you get a really nasty scenario. Mm -hmm. And this will possibly never, you know, we can't really, you know, take it down and say, okay, so this is how it will happen. What, what we can do is to think, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna put our systems, we're gonna stress them to the ultimate extent. And what do we need in those kinds of situations? Well, we will need a set of generic capabilities because that's where we end up. As somebody mentioned here, the scope keep, keeps growing all the time. Yeah. We cannot even imagine all the things that will happen. Yeah. Then we have to go back and say, okay, so what do we need in every kind of really difficult crisis situation? Well, we will need a set of capabilities to manage that situation. It will be quite basic. We will have to communicate. We will always need crisis communication. Mm. Our citizens will need water, heating, food. Mm. So we have to work in that way and, and really think also about these prolonged scenarios that can happen. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And before I turn to you, the audience, and open the floor for questions, I actually have an anecdote that I never tire of saying. Between 2000 and 8 and 2010, I had the privilege of being part of a project run by the International Migration Institute at the University of Oxford. And it was a Eurocentric and we were building future migration scenarios. And scenario building draws on expertise from all over the world. So labor, unions, investment bankers, oil companies, people like me, migration experts, etc., etc. In uh, December 2009, we were in The Hague, and one of the implausible 
uh, assumptions. When you build a scenario, you put the sort of plausible assumptions and the implausible assumptions on the quadrant. And one of the implausible assumptions was uh, massive upheavals in the Middle East leading to mass population movement. And everybody said, yeah, all right, okay. Um, let's move on to the serious stuff. That was December 2010. Lo and behold, what happened in... And that, as uh, Johan said and as Emily said, we can't use these paradigms of planning for a world that we think up to 2010 when the paradigm had completely shifted, but we were still dealing with a certain world. We were still thinking that the Middle East and the regimes in the Middle East are a certain an unchallenged certainty. So in an uncertain world, and in what we're trying to unpack here, uh, we're here to engage and to answer more questions. We've got a couple of microphones floating around. Uh, please raise your hand, the microphone will come to you, and before you do, could I just ask you to introduce yourself and uh, we would like to focus on questions rather than an actual thesis. So could you be brief with your question so we can devote more time to the discussion? No worries, I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Tamara, I'm a master's student on sustainability and I just want to ask the panel what the role of businesses is and of innovation when discussing planning in all this disaster management, thanks. Is this a, a specific to any of the members of the panel or who would like to take this? We'll, we'll take one question at a time. So anybody would like to respond? Sarah? Well, I mean, I, I confessed earlier during my intervention that we aren't working enough with private sector, but obviously business has a big role to play here. And uh, I mean, it suffice to, to look at, at all these critical infrastructures that we, we, we're discussing what one of the values of national security here is maintaining the functionality of our, uh, of our critical infrastructures. And for this, we need to interact. And we did a very interesting project a few years ago where we looked at uh, Mälaren and we, uh, we looked at how Mälaren could be flooded. And we actually went around and talked to, uh, first of all, all these municipalities surrounding, but also all the businesses that lay around Mälaren. And we discussed with them, how, how would this affect you? If Mälaren would rise and all these, uh, this would be underwater, uh, these service tunnels would be underwater, we would have electricity uh, failure here, uh, communications would be disrupted here. And we had this discussion with them and it was so valuable and it gave rise, I think, to a lot of positive effects within these municipalities in terms of dialogue with business. So yes, of course, business has a super important role here. Uh, we also do, I mean, we fund, we, have, uh, we fund research and we aren't really, I would say, doing innovation within MSB, but we are actually funding an innovation platform within the Swedish Defence Research Agency. And, uh, they are looking at various solutions, I mean, in terms of also how we're developing our equipment, for example, in what we're doing in rescue services. Innovations are absolutely necessary. Uh, I mean, it's, um, we see, um, uh, I can mention another concrete example that we've been looking at uh, things like antimicrobial resistance, for example. How will this change society? Well, here we can see that this will have quite concrete impact on our line of business. It will affect how we can interact with patients, it will affect our equipment, uh, it will affect um, how ambulance services work. So many, many examples of this. So business have a, a very important role to play, but um, we need to, I think, as I said before, I think we need to find also new ways of engaging with them. We aren't doing enough. Yeah. Margaret? Let, let me just tell you, I think there are two or three things to consider why it hasn't happened yet <clears throat> and how we went about getting business involved in defining their own role and contribution to Sendai. First, and that takes some energy, you need to work with business so that they define their own interest 
in actually mm. not engaging, but in de de uh, defending or protecting their own business sustainability. Their money, their labor force, their water, transport, their infrastructure. And so we did a, we did a work actually with um, PwC as a helping agent and we sp spent an enormous amount of time even getting into the CEO's office for this question. That was, you know, 20% win <laughs> among the many we tried. And, you know, we're not really understanding who are these people, disasters, humanitarian things. Yes, we give money. Yes, we send trucks. So, after some hard work and thinking through risk management and what happens to you and how do you pay for it and do it actually get to your boardroom and how does it turn up into your financial reports. So the more you talk about it, the more it became a more real issue and you can also see how business actually discount for losses that they don't want to declare. So one thing that we have found is, of course, that business lose money in disaster situations, but they hide it. They hide the losses, they just disappear. What they cannot hide is that people don't come to work because there is no transport, um, because the kids are not going to school, because the schools are closed, etc. So that whole process of defining their own interest in engaging is number one. Secondly, is to really look at what is the cost actually, how much, what are the losses, the direct ones and the indirect ones, and who pays. And this differs between country. Once upon a time in the 50s, I think, in the United States, the government basically paid, um, the private sector paid 90% of all cost that disasters incurred. That has completely turned around. Today, the government pays the 90% and the private sector pays, well, I think individuals pay the rest and the business pay very little. You know that many governments, they actually pay business to get back into business in order to get the economy rolling again. And the third point, or the fourth rather, I would like to comment is, is the most difficult one to deal with, is this, and Sarah touched on it, is this mutual reluctance. Business don't want to get over-regulated, so be careful, don't get too close to government. There is an option, participate in designing the regulation, but mostly it's don't get too close. And governments, they don't, really think this is nice stuff. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons that keep them apart. So, um, I, I think a starting point is defining the common interest. Mm -hmm. And the common interest is around things that have an impact on both of the sectors. And, uh, you know, Japan sometimes is held up as very good at this collaboration with private sector, but it's essentially through regulation and legislation, which is fine, it's worked, they are there, but that doesn't work everywhere. So I think this is a, it's a major opportunity, it's a necessity, but finding the governance model that makes it feasible and natural and spontaneous still remains to be done. We've been testing, we were testing, we asked for volunteers among some government. Can you volunteer and um, businesses to come and talk? No press releases, no profile. Just how can this work in reality so that we don't have to recreate it every time? Uh, and, and maybe I should mention also this is normally among uh, manufacturing industry. There's a huge work to be done with tourism industry. There is an enormous work to be done by finance and capital. Uh, Dan mentioned all these 30% of all, 50% uh, of all the cities that we have to live in haven't been built yet. That's a lot of trillions of dollars of investment. So if capital wants to protect their investment for the future, there is a model for how they can do it. It exists, it's not to be innovated, it already exists. So how do you motivate them? You have to pull them all out of their caves. 
<laughs> and it's Sarah who needs to do that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. And 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 that is also. I mean, th there is a emerging trend of socially and ecologically responsible entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Yeah. There are some coming. Not just the yeah. the giant ones doing the uh, corporate social mm. responsibility, but mm. young, aware active entrepreneurs who are starting companies that, with a very different ethos of that. We had another question here. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Svetlo Tsolova and I work in a European Agency for Disease Prevention and Control. Maybe some of you are aware of, some of you not. It's located in Stockholm and our mandate is collecting data and making risk assessments uh, specifically for infectious diseases. So we touch upon almost all the topics that were discussed today and I would like to thank you very much for the very enlightenment talks. My question is, we talked just right now about involvement of probably private sector and business, but still governments probably need to be much more engaged. And um, in health area, thanks to Margareta and her team, uh, health has been now much more present in Sendai framework and then there are Bangkok principles on, on health. But it's health after a disaster. But what about if a disaster is caused by health issue, like by infectious disease? And we don't hear much about infectious diseases because it, it, there, is, there was a lot of work in the last 50 years to prevent them. So there, there has been a lot of investment but we see the opposite trend now. Governments disinvest in public health, especially with the financial crisis where there were significant reductions in public health services, mm -hmm. including health. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, we, we hear from Sarah that still needs to be done mm. with engaging and, and, and promoting, but how do we really promote preparedness planning to the governments so that they would invest? So um, I think many of the speakers can answer this, but I would be curious to hear because it's one of our tasks as well. Thank sure. you. Sure. Sarah, would you like to respond? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we do have contingency planning. We have actually at national level a contingency plan for pandemic preparedness that was born out of H1N1. Um, so we're doing that. And uh, when it comes to preventive efforts uh, or even things like, for example, I mean, what we're looking at is a bit like you need to stockpile certain medicines, for example, in terms of that we're moving more into preparedness. So we are doing this, but this is a, it's a constant struggle. It's a matter of resources and, and what, you, what you're giving a priority to. Uh, but... Uh, I would say that Sweden, compared to many other countries, still has a reasonably high level of preparedness in this area. Um, that would be my answer. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that there was no doubt that after the Ebola crisis in West Africa, um, there was almost a consensus and an agreement that this was not just an epidemic. This was a failure in a public health system. If you had had a public health system, a functioning one, in any of these countries, mm. then a lot of this could have been contained yeah. and not spread as bushfire as, as it were. So, and I think when you talk about preparedness to that, well, mm. of course, there is preparedness in terms of stockpiling, in terms, yeah. but you're supposed to be managing the residual risk yeah. rather than sort of the actual outbreak. Mm. A public health system would, con would contain that. Before we move on to the next question, and can I, can I put you on the spot again? And um, with something like the Ebola crisis, which is also a classic case of a cascading, um, how, do you, how do you see that? Not, not actually something similar happening in Sweden, but how do you, what would be your advice as a system of systems to a country like Sierra Leone or Liberia or uh, Guinea, for example. Want to play with that? Oh, no, not really to uh, advise on healthcare systems, but I mean, I could reflect on the interconnectedness here. And, yeah. and obviously, transport systems are interconnected now, and that opens up, again, possibilities for consequences of consequences, spreading of diseases. 
And I mean, one lesson one can learn from, from studying the design of this type of, of system is compartmentation. I mean, you, 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 you need the ability to compartmentalize, to contain things. Otherwise, you, you will simply spread it to the whole system. Okay, good. Can I? Dan? Yeah. Yes. Um, in Liberia, there was a point for the approximately the first half of the Ebola crisis when the government's reaction was quarantine. And it was essentially an enforcement response. And to some degree, I mean, it was certainly policing, and to some degree, it was direct military response. And the epidemic continued and getting out of control. And at a point, they essentially reversed their policy. And they said, we can't do this by enforcement. We can only do this by consent. We have to explain. We have to mobilize. We have to get people's support for this so that they stop breaking out of the quarantine areas. Mm -hmm. We still want them to stay, <laughs> to stay put, but they must understand why they should be staying put. And you, you've commented ab about this point of the governments um, becoming willing to evaluate themselves and hold themselves to standards. Well, the Liberian government carried out its own evaluation afterwards and said, you know, we got it wrong for half the time, yeah. and then we started to get it right. Yeah. And, as, you know, and the uh, crisis fell away quite quickly. In Nigeria, there was a real fear that Ebola was going to spread. And I don't know if you remember the details at all, but there were a, a few cases reported and then suddenly not. And I think almost everybody has who has looked at that has said, well, there was a, a quick um, dissemination of so-called Ebola rules. Uh, this is how you relate to each other. Uh, don't shake hands, don't kiss, don't get close, stay a certain distance from each other, just everybody, just, you know. And this was all spread by social media. Now, to think of this as being a triumph for social media would be one way around. But my question is, well, where did that information come from? Mm -hmm. And why was it trusted? Mm -hmm. Because that is the key thing. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot, when one's talking about resilience and thinking of it as a generic capability, the issue is information. Is this a community, a group, a society, a company, a person who can absorb information, analyze and understand it, mm -hmm. figure out what to do with it, disseminate as necessary and act upon it. If so, you'll probably find then that you have a kind of fungible resilience that, will, that helps that community or whatever um, handle conflict, mm -hmm. um, respond creatively to epidemics, uh, deal with extreme weather events. Um, you, you will find because they have adaptability. Information is in many ways the core of this, uh, this whole thing. We've got time for one or two more questions. So, Shu? And you've got yeah. three, so go for three. three. So, my four. name is Shu Liang, sorry. Um, I'm a master's student here at Dune University, and I would like to just uh, ask for a story. Um, so far, we've heard a lot of perspectives, but one thing I noticed when I was doing my internship in Kenya was that we, like a lot of people working in the field, we are believers. And the truth of the matter is, it's, the, the real resistance is in, in people's reluctance in buying into mainstreaming DRR, uh, disaster risk reduction. So I would like to get your story in your career, how you've witnessed some, some resistance turn into support. I mean, I think we can all think of a few leaders that can, can turn their to, to different camps. So if you can share a story um, that we can draw some wisdom from, that would be great. <laughs> Who wants to take that and very quickly so we can take two more questions? Story <laughs> that changed <laughs> things. Um, maybe for me, it's a personal story which changed the way that I wanted to approach the so called community involvement. I say so called because, you know, community can be really the lowest level of a society, but um, I decided in the beginning of this job to go and visit community cities that had been affected by disasters 10, 15, 20 years earlier, just to understand what stays with you. 
because what stays with people will have to be the issues we have to tackle. So um, uh, I visited Maharashtra, uh, which 15 years then, so 20 years earlier, had an earthquake. And they were given by very nice people new earthquake houses. Very nice, moved the village. So meeting with lots of women and men for that matter, but separately. So when I asked the women, um, so what's the result of all this? What do you remember? Well, no one remembered the houses, except a grandmother who was very happy that her kids had now a safe house. But what they remember was the two things. One, they said there were lots of these livelihoods projects, really useless. We were just selling things to each other. <laughs> there you go. And secondly, when I, I asked them, well, what do you think people like me could do for you? Is there anything that I can take away here with me? They say, yeah, you, can you tell us how we can reach the highest level of our government and the world so that they can deal with these climate change issues. Our harvests are completely confused. The rains never come when we expect them. The seeds don't work. So that I have used then as an approach. The other one, I actually went back to Kobe in Japan after the earthquake and talked to some people. And it was the same thing, what really stayed. And what really stayed with two things, and eventually they had a very successful reconstruction. The first thing was the economic disempowerment. They never got their jobs back. And people lost social dignity. And, and, and then social health, because a lot of violence in the family and substance abuse. So that's what I took away from there. So you can see it's social and economic issues. It's not physical issues. Actually, thank you, Margaret. I've been given uh, very stern <laughs> signals that we're out of time. <laughs> so what I what I'm going to do now is just ask the panels to go around very quickly and in two or three words each, just tell us, tell everybody, what are the sort of the one or two key messages that we walk away from here with. I'm going to start with you, Emily. And we'll okay. Go around that okay, very quickly. I was just thinking my story would be that we all are heroes of our own stories. And the complexity here is if every stakeholder is a hero in their own story, we have to try and think about ways in which we bring those heroes together to understand their different perspectives. Wonderful. Johan. Nice. Um, if we do not want to use actual disasters as window of opportunity for change. We need to come up with new ways of requisite imagination, if you like, when it comes to how we imagine future possible states and possible ways to interact. And that, I think, is by embracing in cultural activities. Uh, read more literature, get inspired by operas. That, I think, would be a really interesting risk management initiatives if we do not want to wait for the next disasters. Mm. Wonderful. He plays opera in his office and I can hear it from my... <laughs> That's yeah. not even true. <laughs> <laughs> Hendrik. Yes, more briefly. I mean, in a world where everything is connected to everything else, I think we need to collaborate to manage risk. There is simply no other way. Sarah? Well, I'm on the same line here. I thought it was fascinating to hear about the fact that risks or this interconnectedness, it's so much about social networks. It's about people. And I think that really captures the essence of it all here, that, that that's the way forward. We need to cherish these networks. Dan? Yes, two brief points. One is that recovery happens after a disaster because it must. Right? There's no must about prep preparedness. So it requires a, a conscious, collective, deliberate, intercultural, deliberate. creative effort. And the other thing is that it's never a certain world. It has never been a certain world, but sometimes it looks certain. Well, we now have the luxury, this is an uncertain seeming world, and maybe that can liberate our imaginations a bit. Margaret. For me, just a few words. I, you may have heard participants using the word acceptable risk. I want you to think about 
how that is possible, who decides what is acceptable risk for you or for us. Because this is sort of becoming a popular concept which is really dangerous. So please think about it and take a position. I can't tell you what it is, just take a position. <laughs> Thank you very much, Margreta, Dan, Sarah, Henrik, Johan, and Emily, and on behalf of the panel. And I would like to invite Jonas Hafström now to uh, bring this event to a close. Please. Should we step down? Yeah. Thank you. Dear friends, it's been a long day, and between me and the end of the, between you and the end of the conference, I'm standing here, so I better make it quick. Well, thank you all very much for coming to this day-long event, embracing the theme, uh, Is the World Becoming a Better Place? I hope you have enjoyed it and found it rewarding and also thought-provoking. This week started last Sunday. It was a panel discussion and four items were discussed. Democracy, sustainability, equality and connectivity. And the students at the university gave their own perspective. One young student said, and I quote, if we don't believe in what we are doing, we wouldn't have anything else to work for, end of quote. Indeed, if we don't believe that our approach generates long-term progress, jobs, welfare, at the same time preventing wars and conflicts and protecting values such as democracy, freedom and human rights, then we have been wrong for a long time. Or have we? I will give you a personal example. It was the early 1990s. I was working for Prime Minister Carl Bildt, and just before Christmas 1992, the Prime Minister took his closest foreign policy advisors, visiting our soldiers serving with the United Nations peacekeeping operation in Croatia. War was raging in Bosnia, and so we ventured down to the bridge on the border between the two countries bus after bus, with desperate refugees, was crossing over. The ethnic cleansing of Western Bosnia was in its final stages. At home, here in Sweden, we struggle with both an economic crisis and a more massive influx of refugees than we had ever had. One year, brought about 100,000 women, children and men fleeing in the carnage of the Balkans. Most of them were from Bosnia and most of them were Muslims. The combination of that influx and the increasing unemployment made for a toxic debate. Some rallied with whatever argument possible against refugees. And sorry to say, some even resorted to violence. Of course, we had difficulties with this massive influx of refugees from the Balkan Wars. Years later, we faced organized crimes, gangs originating in the tight Balkan smuggling networks that grew up during the wars. There were some brutal shootouts between them in Stockholm. Yet today, some decades later, the story is one of success. Numerous studies have shown that the Bosnian refugees have integrated well in the Swedish society. On average, they do as well or even marginal better than those born in the country. And they are everywhere in sports, in culture, in business and in politics. They have given added flavor to our country, but it's still very much Sweden. They wave the flag and they sing the songs, and I believe they have made Sweden a better country. There are, of course, not the only group that has come to Sweden. 
no less than 17% of our population is from Finland. And I believe we have even more people from Iran than from Bosnia. They are as successful in Sweden as they are in California. Now, many from Syria have also come, although we have had Syrian communities in this country for years. Some groups have sometimes taken longer time to integrate. And the strict structure of our welfare society are more geared to protecting insiders than opening up to outsiders. We need to do better. Every country has its share of challenges. And in much the same way as when we received the refugees from Bosnia, there are certainly those today with different views of how Sweden is managing the latest influx from the Middle East. Donald Trump, for example. I think we should be proud of what our country did during some of the difficult years to offer a new future to some of those fleeing the horrors of the Balkan Wars. That it would turn out to benefit our society, our society is of course also part of making the world becoming a better place. I thank all those who have taken part in today's conference and I look forward to working together on just that. Thank you.